Hello students, welcome to lecture 16 of this course. Last time I discussed about how does the spectra of alkali metals and alkaline earth metals will look like. I will discuss it again and then I will move and show you some application of atomic spectroscopy. As the name suggests, the atomic spectroscopy deals with absorbance or emission of atoms or elemental ions rather than molecule. Since atoms have no vibrational levels, so atomic spectra is generally much sharper than molecular spectra. Not only that, positions of peaks are well defined and each atom has its own characteristic peak and that is main advantage of atomic spectroscopy. The emission lines of different elements are peculiar to that element only and hence every element has a different fingerprint. So if you look at hydrogen, its line is here at this point and this point, this point and these four points. It is quite different than if you look at the spectral lines of sodium atom. They are not at the same position. They are not at the same position. And if you look at the helium, it also has quite different spectra comparison to hydrogen and sodium. Similar is the case of all the atoms, all the atoms. And so, if we look at atomic spectra of different elements, we will be able to figure out which element is in the that particle sample. Here is some other examples of atomic spectra. This is atomic spectra of carbon, this is atomic spectra of oxygen and this is atomic spectra of nitrogen. So each element has its characteristic atomic spectra, hence it is very easy to distinguish between the different atoms using your atomic spectroscopy. The basis of atomic spectroscopy is the energy level diagrams of different atom. The energy level diagram for outer electron of an element describes atomic spectroscopy process. So outer electrons are very important. For example, alkali metals, the outer electrons are in s orbital and so the one electron in outermost s orbital basically describes its atomic spectroscopy process. For hydrogen atom, 2s, 2p orbitals are degenerate, that is what we discussed during last lectures. However, the degeneracy is lost for multi-electron system. I am just giving you a recap of previous lectures. Again, P, D, F orbital is split due to spin orbit coupling. So these are the few things which we already have discussed in the previous lecture. Now let us go back uh, and see, again discuss spectra of alkali metals. Here spectra arises from transition between NS1 state to NP1 state. The transition can happen from NS1 state to N plus 1P state or NS1 state to N plus 2P1 state. And since the electron is finally ending up in the P level and so the series which arises from these transitions are called principal series. The spectra of alkali metal also consist of transition between NP1 state to N plus 1 S1 or N plus 2 S1. So now we are looking at the transition from first excited state or second excited state to N plus 1 S1 state or N plus 2 S1 state because this is also allowed transition since delta L is minus 1 delta L is minus 1. And when the final electron, the electron which is getting promoted is landing up in the s orbital, 
the spectra which is due to transition between these states are known as sharp series. Similarly, spectra can also have transition contribution from transition between NP1 state to N plus 1 D1, N plus 2 D1 state. And since electrons are landing up in D state and so it is known as diffuse series. It is known as diffuse series. Transition between NS1 to N plus 1 D1 is not allowed since delta L is plus 2. So, transition is not allowed between S to D, S state to D state. Now, let us look at what are the energy levels associated with 1 S 1 or 3 S 1 electron which is basically a ground state of alkali metal. So, for S 1 electron L is 0 and S is half, S is half. There is only one electron and its L value is 0 and S value is half. So, J have only one value and that is plus half. And since this L is equal to 0 corresponds to S state and so the energy level associated with 1s1, 2s1, 3s1 is S and the more specific notation is 2s half. Now, you can see this is your multiplicity which is given by 2s plus 1 and that is 2 into half plus 1 is equal to 2. So, multiplicity is 2 and this is your j value and since there is only one j value, it means the energy states associated with 1 s 1 configuration is only 1 and that is given by 2 s half. Now, if you want to look at the transition between N s 1 to N plus 1 P 1, we also need to look at what will be the energy level associated with this P 1 electron. So, energy level associated with 2 P 1 or 3 P 1 electron is, so if we look at this electron L value is 1 and S value is half. So, J is going to have two values 3 by 2 and half. It means that there will be two energy states associated with 2 P 1 configuration. Since L is equal to 1, so this corresponds to the level P and since J has two value and so the two terms arising due to spin orbit coupling will be 2 p 3 by 2 and 2 p half, 2 p 3 by 2, 2 p half. So, we have seen that only one energy is associated, only one energy level is associated with 2 s 1 electron or 3 s 1 electron whereas, there are two energy states associated with the excited state 2 p 1 or 3 p 1 electron. Now, notation for energy level associated with 3 d 1 or 4 d 1 electron. So, suppose electron is getting promoted from p level to d level. We have already seen what will be the energy number of energy levels when electron is in the p orbital. But if suppose electron is going from P to D, then we need to know what is the energy levels associated with 3 D 1 electron or N D 1 electron. So, for D 1 electron L is equal to 2, S is equal to half. So, J is going to have two values. So, plus 5 by 2 and plus 3 by 2. So, it is going to have two energy levels 
since L is equal to 2, it means we are dealing with the level D and since there are two j value, it will get a split into two levels due to spin orbit coupling and those levels are 2 d 5 by 2 and 2 d 3 by 2. So, now we have looked at that there is only one energy level associated with one S 1 configuration, there are two levels associated with n p 1 or n d 1 electron. Now, we will look at the transition. So, suppose your electron is going from S to P, then we can think of this transition which is called principal transition and the transition which is allowed is 2 s half going to 2 p 3 by 2 and 2 s half going to 2 p half. If you remember the selection rule is delta j is equal to 0 and plus minus 1. So, electron going from 2 s half to 2 p 3 by 2 is allowed because delta j is 1. Similarly, electron going from 2 s half to 2 p half is also allowed since delta j will be equal to 0. So, this is for the principal series for electron going from S 1 configuration to P 1 configuration. Now, look at the electron going from P 1 to D 1, which is allowed transition because delta L is plus 1. Now, we have just seen that P level is basically split into two levels due to spin orbit coupling. Similarly, D level is split into two due to spin orbit coupling and the, the terms for these two energy levels are 2 p half and 2 p 3 by 2. Similarly, the term for your T level splitting is 2 d 5 by 2 and 2 d 3 by 2. Now, if we look at the transition from P level to D level, what we can see is P the transition from 2 p half to 2 d 3 by 2 is allowed since delta j is 1, but transition from 2 p half to 2 d 5 by 2 is not allowed since delta j in that case will be your plus 2. So, that is not allowed transition. So, you see just only one transition from 2 p half. Now, look at the transition from 2 p 3 by 2 both transitions are allowed. It means transition from 2 p 3 by 2 to 2 d 3 by 2 is allowed and 2 p 3 by 2 to 2 d 5 by 2 is also allowed since delta j is either 0 or plus 1. So, this leads to a doublet in the principal series of sodium atom whereas, there is a compound doublet in the diffuse series in the spectrum of sodium atom. Now, why compound doublet, why not triplet that I have already discussed and that is because of the very narrow gap between 2 d 3 by 2 and 2 d 5 by 2. So, what happens that lambda max of these two transition is almost at similar position and sometime it looks like a diffused or it looks like one peak and so triplet is basically known as compound doublet. Now, we will go and look at the spectra of helium and alkaline earth metal atoms. For this selection rule is delta L is equal to plus minus 1 for promoted electron and delta S is equal to 0 and delta n is certainly unlimited. So, here only thing I have added is delta s is equal to 0 and we will discuss why this is important. So, the spectra of alkaline earth metal 
will arise from transition between NS2 state to NS1 and P1 state or NS1 N plus 1 P1. And since the promoted electron uh, lands up in P orbital, so it is known as principal series. The other line will corresponds to transition between NS1 NP1 state to NS1 N plus 1 S1 or NS1 N plus 2 S1. So, it is from the excited state to the S state only and since now promoted electron is in the S orbital, so it is known as sharp series. A spectra will also consist of transition between these states. So, P1 to D1 and as I discussed that since the promoted electron is now in D orbital and so this is known as diffuse series. Now, let us think about the energy level associated with S2 electron. S2 electron of alkali metals, alkaline metals, S2 electron of alkaline metals. So, 1 S2 or 3 S2 or 2 S2 electron which we are discussing about. We have already discussed about how to calculate the energy levels of or energy of helium orbital. What we used to do is we used to take 2 electrons as 2 system one system consisting of one electron and this nucleus and the second system consisting of electron and nucleus. So, that is what we are going to take here. We will not consider this as a 1 S 2 electron, but we are going to consider this as S 1 S 1 electron. When we will do it for the first electron L 1 is 0 and S is equal to half for second electron L is equal to 0 and S is equal to half. So, capital L is equal to 0 and capital S is equal to your 1 or 0. Since, if you remember capital S is equal to S 1 small s 1 plus S 2 and going to S 1 minus S 2 with the this thing. So, when we add this up, we will get 1 and when we subtract this, we will get 0. So, we have 2 value of S and 1 value of L and if I calculate J, if I take S 1, then it is 0 plus 1, 1 and for 0, 0 there will be 0. So, we have 2 J value, 2 S value and 1 L value. L is 0. So, it will corresponds to level S and if we go and take S is equal to 1, J is equal to 1, then we will get 3 S 1. Whereas, if we take S is equal to 0 and J is equal to 0, then I will get 1 S 0. So, there is 2 terms arising from S 1, S 1 electrons. 3 S 1 and 1 S 0. Now, we will look at the spin orbit coupling for S 1 P 1 configuration. So, for S 1 P 1 configuration or S 1 P 1 electron, we have 2 different terms 1 P 3 P and we can get this terms as we have done for S 1 S 1. Now, let us look at 3 p. For 3 p energy level, L is equal to 1 for this p and S is equal to 1 because multiplicity is 3. And so, J value will be your L plus S to L minus S and that means, J has 3 values. So, 3, 3 p energy level will be split into 3 levels due to spin orbit coupling. Now, I have just taken 3 p not 1 p since what I am going to look at is transition from 
this state 3 s 1 to your 3 p levels 3 p this 3 p level. Why I am taking 3 s is because you remember delta s should be 0 for the transition. If delta s is equal to 0 then only we have allowed transition. So, if we are looking at the transition from 3 s state the allowed transition will be in the 3 p state not in 1 p state and that is why I just discussed the splitting of 3 p energy levels. So, now we know that 3 s level if you look at 3 s level you have only one 3 s level in if the configuration is 1 s 2 whereas, there are 3 energy levels. So, here I have done ok. So, 3 p 2, 3 p 1. So, p level goes into 3 different levels. Now, what we will do is I think here I have done wrong this will be 3, this will be 3. So, 3 p is split into 3 different levels 3 p 2, 3 p 1 and 3 p 0 and these are the j values 2, 1, 0. So, now we will look at the transition from your 3 s level to 3 p level and since it is ending up electron is ending up in 3 p level this will corresponds to principal series, principal series and here we are looking at the transition from p to d and so this will be the diffuse series. Now, look at this is 3 s 1 and here there are 3 different states coming out from 3 p due to spin orbital coupling and again delta j will be equal to 0 plus minus 1 and so the transition is allowed between 3 s 1 to 3 p 0 since delta j is minus 1. 3 s 1 to 3 p 1 since delta j is equal to 0 and 3 s 1 to 3 p 2 since delta j is equal to plus 1. So, 3 transition are allowed and we will get a simple triplet and if we look at the transition from 3 p to 3 d or let us start from 3 p 0 there is only one transition allowed between 3 p 0 to 3 d 1 since delta j is equal to 1, but 3 p 0 to 3 d 2 is not allowed because delta j is 2 and 3 p 0 to 3 d 3 is not allowed since delta j is equal to 3. From 3 p 1 only 2 transitions are allowed 3 p 1 to 3 d 1 since delta j is equal to 0, 3 p 1 to 3 d 2 since delta j is equal to 1. 3 p 1 to 3 d 3 is not allowed since delta j is equal to 2. Transition between 3 p 2 to 3 d 3 and 3 d 2 and 3 d 1 all are allowed since if we go from 3 p 2 to 3 d 1 delta j is minus 1. If you go from 3 p 2 to 3 d 2 delta j is 0 and if you go from 3 p 2 to 3 d 3 delta j is plus 1. So, all 3 transitions are allowed, but as we discussed this will come like uh, overlapping peak and this will also come like overlapping peak. This will not come as 5 peaks, but it will be like a compound triplet. So, this is the way we discuss or we understand the spectrum of different elements. Here I have shown you the spectrum of alkaline earth metals, where we are going from S 2 to S 1 P 1 or S 1 P 1 to S 1 D 1. Now, we have discussed atomic spectra, we will go to the techniques which is based on atomic spectra 
first we will discuss the technique and then we will look at the application. So, first technique which is based on atomic spectroscopy known as flame photometry. Flame photometry which is also known as flame in emission spectroscopy measures the emitted photons produced when the sample is introduced into the flame. The wavelength of emitted light is unique for an atom and that is why it helps in the identification of the element. The intensity of the flame determines the amount of the element present in the sample. Here I mean intensity of flame at the lambda max determines the amount of element present in the sample. Flame photometry basically based on the same principle as the flame test used in qualitative analysis. If you remember qualitative analysis, if we used to put sodium, we used to get a yellow flame. Lithium used to give you crimson color. Calcium gives you brick red color. Estroncium gives you crimson color and barium gives you green, green color. What is basically happening is electron is going from ground state to excited state and then it comes back to ground state by emitting light and lambda max will change for different kind of atom and the color of flame will depend on the lambda max and just by looking at the color you can know that which atom is present in that particular sample. This is when atom is put into the flame but you can also put compound in the flame. What happens that if I put compound in flame, compound is broken into atoms and then we can see the spectra due to atom. That is what is happening here. Now, first I will discuss about instrumentation. The instrumentation of flame spectrometer has four important component. One is source of flame, the second is nebulizer or mixing chamber and third is optical system and photo detector. And a typical representation of flame photometer is given here. So, here is sample, here is atomizer and then you are mixing fuel here that is mixing chamber and when it is burned there is a flame, you pass through lens and then through slit, it again goes through filter and then finally here is the amplifier and you see the signal on LCD display. So, it is quite simple representation. Now, first we will discuss about source of flame. It is very important to use the right flame if uh, you want to know whether a particular element is present in the sample or not. These are the fuel oxidant mixture used for flame burner. Why we use different uh, fuel oxidant mixture? Because the flame temperature is an important factor in flame photometry. The temperature depends upon the ratio of oxidant and fuel. For example, natural gas and air mixture temperature is 1700 degree Celsius propane air is 1800 degree Celsius. So, depending on the kind of element you are analyzing, you need to use different kind of flames. Acetylene air is 2300 degree Celsius. So, this is about the sources of flame. What that this flame does is that high temperature of flame excites a valence electron to a higher energy orbital. And then what happens that atom then emits energy in the form of light as the electron falls back into lower energy orbit. So, here you are supplying energy as heat and what you are getting back is the energy 
in form of light, energy in form of light or electromagnetic radiation. The intensity of the absorbed light is proportional to the concentration of the element in the flame. So, intensity of absorbed light is proportional to concentration of the element in the flame, whereas lambda max will depend on the gap between two atomic orbitals or two atomic energy states. So, when I put my sample into a burner, what will happen is you have this salt. Suppose you have put salt in a flame, then first thing will happen is salt will vaporize to gas and then salt will dissociate into atoms. This atom will go to excited state and when it comes back to ground state, it will emit light. This is the way flame your flame emission spectroscopy works. Now, other part of the instrumentation is optical system. It has three different part convex mirror. If you remember the schematic diagram of the flame photometer, there was a convex mirror. It basically transmits the emitted light and focuses it to the lens. Now, what lens does? It helps to focus the emitted light onto a point called slit and then the third party color filter. When the emitted light pass through the slit, color filter isolate the wavelength of interest from the rest of the irrelevant emission, rest of the irrelevant emission. So, these are the part of optical system used in the flame photometer. And finally, photo detector, it detects the intensity of emitted radiation, which then is converted into electrical signals, electrical signals. Now, this is your working flame, working of flame photometer. So, first thing is ions are taken in solution and when you do aspiration, what we you will get is aerosol and it will vaporize in the flame to give you molecule in the gas phase and then atomization will take place, which is basically thermal dissociation to atom. Atom has one electron and that will get excited to the excited state on absorption of heat and when it comes back to the ground state, then energy will be emitted as light. So, this is a simple working scheme of a flame photometer. So, the whole process has several different steps. First is solution of analyte is nebulized into a spray, nebulized in the spray and then desolvation process happens which forms solid to gas aerosol. That is what we discussed that how solution is going to aerosol. When you put this into a flame, then volatilization happens and this aerosols convert into gaseous molecule. Now, this molecule can go to excited state since it is being heated and so it can go to excited state then you will be dealing with molecular spectroscopy. The other thing which can happen is gaseous molecule can dissociate to give atoms and now atoms can go to excited state and then we are dealing with atomic spectroscopy. The third thing can happen that atoms can get ionized and then it can go to excited state. In that case, again we are dealing with atomic spectroscopy. So, there are three important terms we came across nebulization, desolvation and volatilization. Nebulization is conversion of liquid sample to fine spray. So, you started with liquid sample and you want to make it into a spray that process is called nebulization. Now, in the desolvation solid atoms are mixed into the gaseous fuel to make it aerosol 
aerosol. So now the solid atoms in water is mixed with gaseous fuel to give you aerosol. And the last step is your volatilization which is basically when solid atoms are converted to a vapor in the flame, vapor in the flame. So the temperature must be very high so that atom can be converted into vapor. So it is atom need to be converted into vapor. So if you understand this, you now know that three types of particle can exist in flame, atoms, ions and molecules. But what we are mainly concerned in atomic spectroscopy is atoms and ions. So this is about flame photometry. Now we will go to much higher technique called atomic absorption spectrometer. The only difference is now our source will be different, method of atomization will be different and the source of flame will also be different. What we mean radiation source is different. So the first thing which we discussed is your atomic flame photometer. Sample here sample solution is spirited into a flame and we use this for this we use hollow lamp. For atomic spectroscopy which is basically atomic absorption spectrometer when we take a situation where we are now not taking flame. So non flame condition in this case what we need to do is we take sample solution evaporated and ignited, sample solution evaporated and ignited. This is the method of atomization and for that radiation source is your hollow cathode lamp, hollow cathode lamp. So I think this is, this is just cancel this out, sorry for this. So for the second type of atomic absorption spectrometer which is based which is not based on flame is when we use hollow cathode lamp as a radiation source. In this case sample solution gets evaporated and ignited using hollow cathode lamp. In the third kind we have x-ray absorption tube here method of atomization not required and radiation source is X-ray, radiation source is X-ray. What is hollow cathode lamp? It is example of a metal vapor lamp that emits light at the characteristic wavelength of the metal in the cathode. The lamp gas is under near vacuum condition and electron flow ionizes the gas, the cations bombard the cathode to vaporize the matter. Combination of ion atom collision, electron atom collision and other processes excite the electron inside the metal vapor atoms which emit light. This is the basis of hollow cathode lamp SCL. So this is like uh, this is a schematic representation of hollow cathode lamp. This is your cathode and this is shielded by a glass, this is a glass envelope, this is window and this is a node and uh, electron and ionic impact on cathode will happen. MS will first go to M gas metal from solid form to metal in gas form. Then this get excited and when excited metal comes back to ground state it will give you light H nu. It will give you light. Now second kind of spectroscopy based on atomic spectroscopy is atomic emission spectrometer. Here there can be different types and method of atomization is different. Arc type method of atomization is sample heated in an electric arc. When the type is a spark then sample excited is high voltage spark. Then you have argon plasma flame sample heated in an argon plasma sample solution aspirated into a flame. Then X-ray emission sample bombarded with electron, sample bombarded with electron. 
Now, all these three methods flame photometry, atomic absorption spectroscopy and atomic emission spectroscopy helps us to detect the atom and the atoms detected by atomic spectroscopy are quite large and here is the a list of atoms which can be detected from atomic spectroscopy. So, this color which is pink will tell you that which metals can be detected by atomic spectroscopy whereas, these metals cannot be detected by atomic spectroscopy. So, you can see that there are large number of atoms which can be detected by atomic spectroscopy and that is one of the very important advantage of using atomic spectroscope. There are characteristic emission wavelengths of some metals. For example, antimony emitted wavelength comes at around 253 nanometer, copper 325 nanometer, nickel 355 nanometer, iron 372 nanometer. So, if you look at the atomic spectra and if you see these peaks, for example, 350, a peak at 355 nanometer, then you can't say that nickel is present in that sample. Nickel is present in that sample. Okay, this is some detection limit in ppm. This is the difference between flame AS and flame ES. So, always your concentration of the metal detected from different spectroscopy is different and this is the list. You can find out this on the on different books. So, I am not going to discuss that much. Now, what is the other use apart from detecting the matter? We can also know the concentration of element in solution using atomic spectroscopy. What we can do is we can look at the intensity or absorbance at the particular wavelength at which a particular atom absorbs or emits, absorbs and emits. And absorbance we know is related to intensity by this formula which is Beer's Lambert's law. Here I t is transmitted radiation, intensity of transmitter radiation and I 0 is intensity of incident radiation. Again in atomic emission we can look at the transmittance, we can look at the transmittance or transmission. Once we know that this absorbance or transmission is proportional to concentration and so we can know the concentration of particular element in the solution. The way we do is for example, if suppose you have iron in a sample what we do is, so first thing which you need to do suppose I want to calculate the concentration of iron in a particular sample is you make a standard solution of iron uh, for example, iron sulphate. Take a particular concentration and make different, make the sample, several samples in 50 ml volumetric flask of different iron concentration, different iron concentration. And then what you do is you look at the absorbance of these samples and then you first make a calibration curve calibration curve. So, you see here what has been done is iron concentration in ppm and here is the absorbance. So, you are plotting absorbance versus iron concentration in ppm and you make a calibration curve and this is your calibration curve. Now, you take your sample in which you want to know the concentration of iron and then you see where it is end up. For example, it end up in between. Then you know what will be the concentration of iron in that sample. So, it will be around 2.5 ppm, 2.5 ppm. If 
the absorbance of your sample is around this 0 0.6 or something like that. So, you can calculate the amount of an element in the sample using your flame photometry or atomic absorbance spectroscopy or your emission spectroscopy. First thing you need to do is the make calibration curve with the standard sample. Once you do that, then it is very easy to know what is the concentration of the element in particular sample in that particular sample which you want to analyze. Now, we will go to look at application of atomic absorption spectroscopy. There are several different kind of application of atomic spectroscopy. Here are the different fields in which atomic spectroscopy is atomic spectroscopy is right now being used. First is environmental, forensic science, agriculture, clinical, pharmaceutical, petrochemicals. Now, first we look at the environmental application. First is monitoring studies in sediment. Atomic absorption spectroscopy has been used for the analysis of many elements. Sediment samples from surficial to segments extracted from the cores. It is applied or application includes qualitative elemental measurements in a wide range of soil and sediment sample to monitor changes in sediment loads and to determine the geochemical processes that alter the chemical species of each element. So, if suppose any geochemical processes is happening that will lead to change in the change in the composition of the sediment. So, you will find different amount of different atoms in the sediment and based on that you can tell which kind of geochemical processes are happening and for that you need to know what is the concentration, what is the amount of different chemical species of each element and that is where atomic spectroscopy can be of help to you. Similarly, you can also look at the analysis of metals in water sample. Metal ion analysis is important aspect during water quality. So, water quality depends on kind of metal ion it has. So, if you get water from either surface or ground, you need to check what are the elements in that water sample and that can tell you whether that water can be used for drinking or not. Although there are several other methods for analysis, but atomic absorption spectroscopy is most commonly used to look at the metal in water because of the reproducibility of results, short analysis time, cost effective, lower level detection and hyphenated in nature. So, first what we need to do is we need to concentrate the metal in the water sample since the element concentration are too low for direct analysis. So, first thing we need to do is pre concentration. The main problem is to prevent contaminating sample of interest during your pre concentration. But once you do that, you can know what is the amount of the different elements present in the water sample. You can also study the metals present in biota. Once you can look at the biotic samples and see what are the different elements present in that biotic sample and what is the concentration of that element. The application here includes quantitative elemental measurements in wide range of samples such as fish, shellfish, mollusk, mussel, algae, lichens, plant species and clams. 
Samples are typically extracted and analyzed from many part of biotic species such as the gills, liver, skin and muscle. So, this is the way to know what is the matters present in that biotic sample. The essential and toxic element for environment. Some metals are essential for the environment and some metals are toxic. What are the essential major elements? It is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Essential trace elements are these, while toxic elements are these 6, lithium, beryllium, lead, Ag, cadmium, chromium and each one of them can be analyzed by atomic absorption spectroscopy or flame photometer. So, next application is in forensic science. In forensic science, you can look for trace elements, you can look for elementor profiles of biological samples, you can also look at the trace elements in artificial fibers, you can look at the determination of the mode of poisoning and the hair analysis for heavy metal poisoning. So, these are the few different things which can help you in forensic science and hence atomic absorption spectroscopy or spectroscopic method based on atomic spectroscopy is quite often used in the forensic science. So, there are other applications, but since time is over, I will like to stop here. These are the two books which I have referred for making notes, which is your modern spectroscopy by Hollas and then uh, the second book is my book, uh, the analytical technique chapters has quite uh, analytical technique chapter has discussed these techniques in details, detail and you can go and look at this uh, chapter. Uh, thank you, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.